Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Walter Edwards. I'm the director of the Humanity Center, and I'm pleased to welcome to the podium, the virtual podium today, uh, two of my colleagues from the English department, Carlin Moan and Clay Walker. Um, Clay Walker. Carlin is the chair of the English department here at Wayne. Uh, she has impressive credentials as a creative artist and scholar and as an administrator. Her creative uh, and scholarly work include poetry publications, including the volumes, The Sleeping, um, What Remains and Three Chapbooks, entitled Cures and Poisons, Greatest Hits and Accidents. She is the editor of the collection of poetry of um, Evelyn Scott and author of Mosaic of Fire, the works of Lola Ridge, Evelyn Scott, Charlotte Wilder, and Kay Boyle. Recent poetry has appeared in the MacGuffin, South Carolina Review, Midwestern Quarterly, among other places. And she's been working with the Writing and Resilience Working Group um, since the fall of 2019. I'm very happy to say that the Humanity Center has contributed a little bit to the funding of that group. Uh, Carlin uh, got her PhD from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She was hired by Wayne State University in 2004 in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, which uh, was a wonderful department, which was part of the College of Urban Labor and Met Metropolitan Affairs that uh, was unfortunately disbanded, but um, uh, their, their demise was uh, was uh, the gain for the English department. She was she joined the English department in 2008. She was promoted to the rank of associate professor in 2011 and currently serves as chair of the English department, a very engaged, very efficient, very, very thoughtful and supporting chair. And she's been doing that since uh, 2018. Prior to this, she was graduate director in the English department from 2014 to 2018. As a recognition of her teaching and mentoring uh, abilities, she was awarded the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2015 and the Outstanding Graduate Director Award in 2017. Um, she is collaborating today um, on this talk with uh, Dr. Clay Walker uh, who got his PhD from the Department of English here at Wayne State University. <laughs> so he is a homeboy and uh, who has made good and has come back to, to serve us. Um, um, and uh, he is a senior lecturer in the Department of English here at uh, Wayne State where he teaches general education writing courses as well as courses in writing studies at the undergraduate and MA levels. His research is focused on how literacy and language are related to power, change, and agency for individuals and institutions. His most recent article entitled Life World Discourse and Translingualism in a Discourse Genealogy of Cesar Chavez was published in Literacy in Composition Studies last summer. In that article, um, uh, Dr. Walker examines how we develop capacities for action through our experiences with literacy and discourses over a lifetime, creating repertoires of literate agency as we use and blend in emergent social and rhetorical situations. He is currently working on a related book-length manuscript funded in part by uh, Wayne State University's um, research grant, and that project is entitled Literacy Potentials, How Agency and Practice Shape Literacies in Archival, in an archival study of, um, of Cesar Chavez. Today, uh, these two scholars are going to collaborate in the presentation entitled Writing Resi Resilience, Thinking Transdisciplinarily About Writing and Pain. So I welcome to the virtual podium Professors uh, Mon and Walker. Thank you so much, Walter. Uh, it's great to be here. 
And I wanted to uh, thank Clay, who's a part of the Writing and Resilience Working Group for joining me in this presentation. And I wanted to acknowledge a couple of other members of the Writing and Resilience Working Group who are in the, um, in the audience. Uh, Professor Mark Lumley in psychology is, in, is, in psychology is here and Kelly Forden is here. She is a, a wonderful writer. Uh, and uh, if I'm missing anybody, it's because um, I don't have the screen set up so I can see everyone. But I'm so happy to see uh, colleagues here from English and from other departments. Um, thank you for, for being here. I'm going to share my slides. I'm not gonna uh, put them on the screen because I'm probably not gonna be able to talk about everything that I have uh, planned. And I'm setting a timer for 20 minutes so that I can turn the, turn the talk over to Clay in a timely way. So I wanted to say a little bit about um, the word transdisciplinary in the title of the talk. And um, this is uh, such a wonderful opportunity to work in, in working groups that the Humanity Center sponsors. And I really wanna encourage other people who are thinking about doing that. It's a great kind of entry point uh, for, for bringing together an interdisciplinary team of people to think about problems across disciplines. And so uh, speaking for myself, what you know, kind of motivated me to move in this direction with this, um, this thinking and research and with the guidance of my colleagues is to talk about um, sort of what is the perennial appeal for creative writing practice and study. And uh, I'm drawing on, my, on two different domains in that question for myself. One is my own practice as a creative writer and also uh, my, my practice as a literary historian and critic. So, um, you know, one of the things that we really wanna do in an academic career is try to tie together and find the trajectory. And for quite a long time, I was working in a couple of different domains that were not obviously connected until, you know, the process of, of developing a tenure file and, and maybe doing the reflection that comes with that. And um, the thing that seems to tie the work that I do in literary studies and creative writing together are uh, questions about wellness and health and good life outcomes. And so uh, when, you know, I think I attended a talk that, that Mark Lumley gave at the Humanity Center and, you know, light bulbs flashed about the work that he does uh, in clinical and research practice in psychology with uh, written express, expressive disclosure, which is, I'll talk a bit about more about that too. But essentially um, thinking about the way that one might use writing either consciously or not, not consciously to kind of improve one's experience kind of broadly. So just sort of a brief outline of what I wanna go over um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Writing and Resilience Working Group and a little bit about the backgrounds uh, for the people who are, who are working in this area. I'll talk a little bit more about my motivations um, for, for doing this kind of study and thinking in this way. And um, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of in broad outline, uh, what, you know, I've learned about expressive writing in clinical practice and also summarize some of the things that you know we've read in our group that creative writers say that touch on on the subject of writing about trauma, and what uh, kinds of outcomes can be, um, ex, you know, gained aesthetically, uh, but also kind of personally from doing that, and also just to kind of speculate about sort of like where this might go from here. Uh, we've been meeting since the fall of 2019, about three times a semester. And um, just, you know, uh, the main people who have kind of been in the group uh, for the long haul are, uh, I'll do this in alphabetical order, um, and I'm going to share some links so that if you're curious about their work, that you can um, You can um, look at it on your own. I want to talk a little bit about Kelly, um, who is a poet and novelist. She is um, just, she's the author of uh, two works of fiction, Garden of the Blind and I Have the Answer. 
a book of poems, Goodbye Toothless House, and a chat book called The Witness. And she brings so much to our discussions because she has used auto, auto fiction, fiction, and poetry to, uh, to kind of explore the significance and um, you know, integrate issues about trauma in her work. And um, she is also very, you know, kind of interested in doing and has done workshops with writers who are exploring those, those issues. Uh, Dean Hartwell in sociology uh, had brought um, her perspective to the conversations, which are to look for kind of um, effective, low cost interventions for people who are transitioning into, um, into mainstream society. And she's also uh, very involved in working on um, ways in which art therapy can be um, used in community um, education projects. And so uh, very interested in neighborhood-based trauma and, um, and basically supporting people who are working through those issues. Uh, Mark Lumley in psychology has you know, longstanding um, interest in written exp expressive disclosure and specifically improvements in health outcomes. And um, the studies that he, he's done, he emphasized uh, in our conversations indicate modest, positive, and significant results in improving health and relieving depression from the practice of written expressive disclosure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, he's been just a really incredible source of knowledge and grounding uh, you know, some of the things that I've been exploring in an intuitive way, you know, it's been just absolutely fabulous to have him at the table in order to kind of bring the perspective from his own research to kind of illuminate things. And then um, Clay Walker is, as uh, Walter introduced him, interested in um, cognitive linguistics, composition theory, literacy studies. And um, we'll be hearing, you know, more about what his reflections are, you know, how this conversation kind of touches on and maybe uh, expands or illuminates um, composition theory and expressivist theories of writing. So some of our goals have been, well, for me, I can speak for myself. My goal has been to try to dip into and catch up on a literature in psychology that helps me to understand or you know kind of connect with what I see in my own creative writing classroom and as I said in my literary research and in um, in my own practice as a creative writer so we've been discussing clinical literature on expressive written disclosure and these interventions in health wellness sometimes in academic improvement and then also I'm at the beginning of this process but thinking about how some of the research design could be translated. And um, this, this kind of you know, idea, there are many, many reasons why uh, and how we can you know, defend the value of the humanities, but it seemed like there may be a window or an opportunity to develop some, um, some classroom research that would help to track the, uh, the effects that we see in the psychological literature within the creative writing classroom. For instance, um, you know, the, the length of time in a kind of a clinical setting that people write about, about their experiences or trauma has an effect uh, over a period of time. And students in creative writing classrooms are writing for, you know, 15 weeks. So it's a very uh, kind of a longer, a longer uh, exposure to kind of writing. I wanted to, um, to also share with you that I had done a course a few years ago and um, the syllabus, it's a 7,000 level um, syllabus for a seminar in creative writing. And this was before, I think this was fall of 2017. So I had already kind of assembled some thinking and, and about how to you know maybe talk about creative writing as it affects our relationship to our bodies and I meant that very broadly. And so the, the, the specific kinds of it, you know, uh, discussions about trauma were both based on creative writing that we read of people discussing their you know, tr trauma or developing it in one way or another, sometimes in surreal ways and sometimes in more straightforward ways, but also sort of cultural traumas. And so 
um, if you if you care to look at the syllabus, you'll see the reading list, and we kind of um, you know kind of very broadly discussed how one can maybe integrate one's experience of trauma or rethink the relationship to the body through creative writing. So that was um, a wonderful group of students, and I think one of the um, we read uh, the critical theory that we read was a book called Visceral po Poetics, and it's on the, the reading list in the, in the syllabus, and it really helped to kind of uh, illuminate, you know, sort of like, you know, um, Dickinson said that she knew it was a poem because it tore the top of her head off, you know, the ways in which we feel uh, deeply what we're reading and feel in a bodily way what, um, what we see happening in literature and so it's it was a really a really good thing to do but it kind of primed the prompt pump for me with regard to uh how to how to think about um integrating these different interests of mine so so basically also some of the other goals of the group i think that are in progress and to be to be determined but are part of this is um, developing research design and i will be you know i'm not teaching a lot right now as chair but uh, I'm getting back into the classroom this summer. I'm teaching a, a teaching of creative writing course this summer. Um, and you know, I'm probably gonna be adding at least one class a year, uh, perhaps one a semester um, going forward. And so I can see going back into like a 20, uh, 2800 or 3800, those are intro creative writing classes and you know, thinking through doing um, institutional research board proposal where you know, I might um, provide at key points a mood, a mood survey or uh, do you know, kind of a grade, um, like at what point in a student's trajectory do they take an integrative creative writing class? What are their grades like before? What are their grades like afterwards? There's a lot of different things that, that are possible, but that I haven't decided on. Um, and the, the point here is that are there some evidence-based, you know, social science informed research methods that could be brought to bear to humanities disciplines to kind of, you know, maybe spark different kinds of conversations about their value or supplement the, the mainstream uh, um, discussions about their value and um, interested in, you know, kind of developing um, a team to topics course on these themes in which I would invite, you know, uh, specialists like uh, Dean Hartwell and Mark Lumley in to the creative writing classroom to talk about uh, things that we've been reading that, that touch on their fields. And uh, a pilot study would be really useful in terms of like, going, um, you know, developing it to a larger grant writing project to support that kind of research. So um, I would say basically uh, with regard specifically to creative writing and health, I have kind of a personal uh, trajectory in that, you know, I uh, am like many, many, many people, maybe many of people in the room, Today, I survived a specific traumatic experience that um, manifested as physical pain much later, like 30 years later. <laughs> there was, you know, kind of pain that was not tied to tissue damage in my body. And so um, there's a lot of stigma around that sort of uh, development. And, uh, but I've been really supported and, you know, basically, um, enabled by discourse around mind-body pain, which is a kind of a, it's, you know, comes out of psychology, but it's, it's kind of a bit broader in some ways than that. And the intervention that I had was with, and, you know, this is not necessarily an endorsement, but some people, you know, might wonder, I used a, an app on my phone called Curable, which is, um, was developed with the expertise in part of a psychologist in the Detroit metropolitan area named uh, Howard Schubiner, who's a colleague of uh, Professor Lumley and a co-author with him on, on some things. And uh, it combines education about um, the brain and its role in interpreting and, you know, kind of uh, manifesting pain. It also kind of makes a, an explicit link between past trauma and present pain, physical pain 
other kinds of pain. And it does so in a way that destigmatizes it, makes it understandable and chunks it into different kinds of activities. So you can you know, meditate or you can write about your issues or whatever. It, it's kind of a broad spectrum um, intervention and I found it extraordinarily effective. So part of it is also untangling the personal mystery of this. I've, you know, I have always uh, used, you know, approached creative writing as a witness uh, from a witness angle and have, um, you know, connected it to personal experience, although it's not strictly autobiographical. Uh, and also poetry for me has been a mode that's been very effective in allowing me to approach difficult material from an oblique angle. So I am shielding myself in some ways, uh, telling it slant, as Dickinson might say, but also reorganizing the information, reorienting myself to that information. And I think the key is integrating the information, uh, the experience in a way that allows me to kind of move beyond it, uh, allow it to kind of um, become part of who I am rather than something that is intruding on who I am, if that makes sense. So um, I would say basically in kind of the way that you see this approached in clinical practice, very kind of in a broad stroke sort of description is uh, the, the person that we've, you know, kind of run into again and again on this topic is a professor named uh, James Pennebaker, who is at UT Austin. And um, starting in like the late 90s, uh, he began to publish articles about uh, what he had found the value of writing or talking about uh, personal experience, specifically trauma, has in a number of different ways as an intervention. So he really uh, focused on having people uh, explore specific experiences. I'm going to give you an example of one of um, Penna Baker's assignments uh, in his, his studies. And I'm just copying and pasting it into the chat. Okay, so you'll see sort of like what he would do is gather, um, you know, groups of, of students because uh, he's working at a university and, you know, in, enroll them, enlist them in, in the study uh, and let them know the risks and uh, basically have a control group that might spend three days writing about, I don't know, time management, for instance, something kind of neutral, and then also have people working on um, targeting things that are maybe more volatile. Um, and the description here is that he'd like uh, his, the, the subjects to write about their very deepest thoughts and feelings about an extremely important emotional issue that has affected you in your life and do, and you know, do this for over several days for approximately 15 to 20 minutes each day. And the way that he, you know, there were a number of different ways that he and his team tried to get at the value of this. One was to, um, you know, have students agree to disclose the number of clinical visits that they had at the university. And so to see sort of like before and after uh, how often they, they went to the clinic over a period of time. Um, another is, you know, to do, blood tests and, and determine immune system function and improvements in Im immune system function. And there, there are other ways too, but uh, there are uh, differences, you know, in the ways that uh, people who undergo this kind of activity, you know, feel and kind of objectively are and the control groups in which there's, you know, um, no kind of no difference. So uh, basically, the, the findings are, and I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit here, but um, initial discomfort. So people who undergo this kind of an assignment initially feel sad or perhaps upset or angry, um, but uh, right afterwards, but they have drops according to the research in physicians and clinic visits, uh, effects lasting up to a year, uh, better immune system function as measured by blood tests, longer term improvements in mood, uh, if their students improvements in their grades, uh, benefits can come either by writing or talking. Talking could be into a tape recorder. 
may uh, be effect more effective to write over several days, even five to 10 minutes, one time can have good effects. And in my, um, the slides that I shared with you, I have the citation for that article. He theor Pennebaker theorized about why this works. And some of them are, you know, kind of an initial theory he had was that basically if, if we're not disclosing the things that are kind of toxic, um, is that it creates an inhibition and this is kind of a long-term low stressor on a person and kind of takes a toll over a long period of time, but that's not proven. Um, he had better evidence that translating the experiences that one has into language can help us to resituate ourselves and um, the experience. And basically we, the writers who seem to gain uh, insight into the causes or were able to kind of think about the why of their situation uh, did better. But the best outcomes are, were found from people who moved from poorly organized writing into more organized writing over a period of days. So, um, and it didn't, you know, uh, I'm citing basically uh, Allison Radcliffe and Mark Lumley and, and their team, but um, sh when people shared the disclosure, you know, basically they knew that there would be an audience of some kind, maybe they would be turning the, the writing back into clinicians, that there was uh, better outcomes with reducing depression and uh, shared disclosure reduces physical symptoms of pain better. So I am um, going to say just a few things about, uh, about where I see connections with creative writing as a practice. Basically, different writers approach this differently. I had um, the experience of, you know, really, really loving the fiction of Stephen King when I was, you know, a teenager. Could you try again? That's my phone talking to us. Sorry about that. Um, but I never really connected why until I read his book on writing, in which he revealed that the, you know, kind of the monsters in his work, a lot of that emotional truth has to do with alcoholism and then you know it kind of slipped into place for me it all clicked it's like it was speaking to me on sort of a subconscious level about alcoholism which is um, a feature of my upbringing and background I was close to people who were alcoholics so uh, sometimes it's oblique you know there's like an infinite variety of ways that people can uh, use their experience in kind of creative um, creative writing but basically um, the, I'm just going to mention two, two people who are doing really interesting work right now from the creative writing side on, on trauma. And one is Roxane Gay. And her book, Hunger, uh, is very straightforward about kind of her past trauma. And then she endured a terrible like public reception in which, um, you know, there were very insensitive like engagements with journalists. Uh, because she's also very open about her her struggle with weight and she connects her weight with past trauma and um, so she's really spending time right now thinking about how to how to do it how to talk about trauma uh, within creative writing in a way that doesn't re-injure or exploit uh, and she has a new essay that came out um, like uh, you know last month that's extremely illuminating you know, about how, how to balance trauma, like what, what space should it take in a narrative? Um, and so she's very thoughtfully thinking about how to teach others how to work with trauma within a, an artistic and aesthetic frameworks. And the reason why maybe a, a aesthetic frameworks would be interesting to explore um, are that it does give a sense of mastery over the material it, it allows people to work with things over time and conceive of an audience in a very kind of specific, but also general way. You're thinking about how do you treat this material so that it is in, you know, it's illuminating to other people who will not know you. And um, so that there may be kind of extra, you know, there might be some extra things to think about from a research standpoint in terms of how people process trauma when they're writing about it creatively. So some of her advice, I'll just very briefly say that she gave to her students at Yale. She recently taught a course on writing trauma. She said, quote, the make the incomprehensible comprehensible. 
create a space in the narrative for both the writer and the reader to see themselves. And uh, she also emphasized that writing is about making choices. And this element of craft may help with gaining perspective and distance and integrating experiences. Um, and I also wanted to mention uh, Melissa Phoebos, who's a, a fiction and also um, nonfiction writer who recently said, you know, expressive writing can, can kind of be, you know, it might be terrible by artistic standards. You know, all the, all of the students who are writing for James Pennebaker were not writing, you know, the next great American novel, but uh, it's not fair to conclude, or, or nor is it logical to conclude that expressive writing has to be terrible. It can be, you know, it can be amazing and it can be, um, you know, kind of transcendent as well. So I'm going to leave it there. And that's kind of just a taste of some of the things that, that we've been doing, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to um, hearing what Clay says. So Clay Walker, thank you so much. Get the unmute your mic. Thanks. <laughs> I just put a copy of my slides there in the chat and I'm just gonna share my screen and then I'll start. So I'll say uh, thanks Carolyn for 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 uh, describing I guess what we've been doing and, and I guess I want to start by saying what I, I think what I was um, first interested in the group was really just taking a look at some of the research on writing and as it relates to psychology. And um, I've long been interested in um, this sort of, these kinds of approaches to thinking about language and writing. And, um, and so I started with that, but as I prepared for this talk, um, I, I'm sort of going to ground it first in a little bit of a review of what expressive writing has meant in the context of my field, which is composition and rhetoric and the teaching of writing for um, largely for gen ed uh, purposes. And then what I'd like to do then after briefly reviewing the, some of that, that history, talk a little bit about some of how some of the things that we've been talking about and it, what writing and expressive writing and resilience might mean uh, for us today in terms of both how we teach gen ed writing and then how all of us as um, academics work with students and writing, especially now where uh, so much of the work that we do with our students is mediated through writing during the pandemic. Um, okay, so in the 70s and 80s, there was a rise of expressivist writing pedagogy. The field of composition and rhetoric has always, I think, been torn between two ends, the sort of the individual student end and then this, the, the social discourse end. The field I coalesced in the 60s as uh, working class students and students of color um, sort of flocked universities. Uh, with the, with uh, increased access to higher education through the GI Bill and other for, other factors and 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 this sort of shift away from a primarily white middle class uh, student population, you know, led to lots of conversations about language and writing and so there's been two kind of uh, poles as I think of them. One of them has been the role of expressivist writing and the sort of thinking about what students themselves bring into these moments. And the other has been sort of couched in terms of an obligation to teach academic language, um, to prepare students for the rigors of academic work. Um, and I'll come back to some of those. So for in the field of composition and rhetoric, a lot of the, the sort of turn to expressivist pedagogy was based in part on James Britton's uh, theories for the functions of language. So here he traces out three ways of thinking of the function of language. Uh, and what was influential for these early thinkers like Donald Murray and Peter Elbow were uh, balancing sort of the expressive and transactional ends of language. So the expressive end were the self or your spectator in the world, you have experiences and 
and those experiences are grounded in your personal um, observation and, and, and life history versus uh, this very social transactional view of, you know, we're participants, we play social roles, we engage with each other in institutions and in social settings. There's an exchange of information or goods and that's mediated through language and, 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 and writing. And so composition pedagogy, they sort of were, you know, has tried to, I think, sort of balance these two. And um, part of this is too, is I think the complicated history of English departments as well, the poetic was left for literary studies and creative writing pedagogy uh, and composition pedagogy sort of picked up the other two, the, the expressive and transactional um, roles of language. Um, so, the critiques, the social terms. So here we're still sort of in the 90s and 80s and 90s and, and the critiques against expressivist approaches to teaching writing emphasize, you know, they were, you know, grounded on postmodern views, the critique of, the, you know, the death of the, of the author and, uh, you know, we're all constructed by discourse. And so those views were used to critique you know, the, the, the purchase that expressivist pedagogies had in the classroom. And that, so you can see some of the sort of views here are vaguely saying that, you know, this, you know, this sort of approach to teaching writing presumes that students can tap into some authentic self that doesn't actually exist. Um, Lisa Delpit argues that, it, you know, the problem with expressivist writing for students of color is that they really need to focus on learning the codes of power. They need to be enmeshed in uh, social discourse. Um, so what I want to sort of focus on here, so, you know, in across, for the field of composition rhetoric anyway, you know, these conversations kind of come to a head with uh, David Bartholome, who is on the social end, uh, and Peter Albo, who is one of the most influential expressivist writers for, for the teaching of writing. And, um, so Bartholome, his, and, they, and these, both of these, I think Bartholome and Elbow are both interested in thinking about how can we empower students and they approach it from different perspectives. So Bartholome, what's important for him is to think about how uh, we help students access power by constructing or reconstructing um, the, the sort of the, the social discourse of the academy academic English and and he wants students to be able to critique how ideology and culture shapes their perspectives and responses to text and how these things function in in text that students read and I do want to look at the two quotes I have here because one of them I, I think I want to come back to these a little bit later on so you know Bartholomew says I also want students to be able to negotiate the ways they are figured in relationship the official forms of knowledge called in the academy. That is, I want them to be prepared to write themselves out of a rhetorical situation in which their roles are already prepared, where they are figured as simple-minded or not yet ready for serious discussion. The writing teacher is the person who not only prompts students to write, but who prompts students to revise, to work on their writing in ways that they would not, if left to, uh, not their own, but the culture's devices. So the 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 role here of the writing teacher for Bartholomew is to help students critique uh, language and, and understand their positionality and how it's constructed through discourse and through pre-existing social relationships. Elbow are used for a view of subjectivity that's maybe a bit socially constructed, but really emphasizes that self-expression. And so, you know, free writing for is um, really the, you know, uh, a mode of writing that Carolyn kind of talked about when she was talking about the Pennebaker's work and uh, where you spend some time just sort of like using writing to sort of explore or articulate an idea without thinking about audience, without thinking about a readership, just sort of finding language to sort of wrap around that element of experience or feeling or whatever. And um, now for Elbow, Free writing is about, you know, I think very much in the same vein about being able to um, find that articulation. He said, I put a lot of faith in the long range benefits of helping students achieve their, their goals. 
helping them gradually relinquish their conditioned assumption that their job is to accomplish our goals, which is to say the teachers of writing in, in, in uh, gen ed courses. So this debate happens in the mid nineties, but you know, I don't think uh, it, both sort of views ultimately today, if you think if you look at composition pedagogy, they're both there uh, in, in, in a way, but you know, things like free writing and journaling still happen in, in writing classrooms. But I would say the social turn won out in the, in the debate here because by and large, when we think about first year writing courses, they're charged with teaching students academic discourse as the main uh, job here, helping students do something that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do on their own. and. I, I think that's the predominant mode in composition pedagogy. Um, expressivist pedagogy is still part of it, but it's sort of, I sort of subordinated in the, the goal of teaching academic discourse. And um, so, you know, there's been, you know, just recently, 10 years ago, Bronwyn Williams was is here trying to recuperate expressivism and composition pedagogy, thinking about how people like Donald Murray and Peter Elbow, they em they're emphasizing students' experience in the, in the world and placing an emphasis on humanism. And I was going to read the quote, what is true is that Don, Donald Murray's work is consistently and deeply humanistic. He clearly believes that each person has distinctive ideas that are worth hearing. His writing is infused with respect for the ideas, integrity of individuals, and the absolute belief that their lives will be fuller if they engage in writing to make meaning from their experiences. Um, you know, so, you know, I think this, you know, Bronwyn Williams here is trying to recuperate the expressivist pedagogy 10 years ago. And I don't think much has changed in the last 10 years in terms of the, the, the role of expressivist pedagogy and how most programs teach writing, including our own, which is, I, you know, primarily serves teaching academic discourse. But at the same time, people like Marilyn Cooper, which we, we read a little bit of her, I think the turn toward embodiment over the last 20 years into affect has changed how we think about subjects and the, the, our relationship to, to the social uh, epistemic practice here of interpreting the world. She writes, writing is not an uh, epistemic or even socio-epistemic practice of interpreting the world, but rather a behavior of interacting in the world. So Cooper is interesting for me and in, in, in my in, as we were working through this because she's talking about how uh, we need to think about creativity as something that is part of all of our language actions. And we have accountability for when, when we write and we use language. We are, we are people, we are, there is a subjectivity and it is tied to, these, to, to the social. But um, when we think about accountability and how we're accountable to when to the text that we create, it, it sort of ties us more closely to the human and non-human objects that we're interacting with. So, um, so one way that I see this sort of question of the sort of balancing the, um, expressivist end with the academic discourse end surfaces for me in questions around what is academic English. And these questions are being pushed by, uh, by people who are working in uh, racial linguistics and in composition and literacy theory, especially in the last five or years or so, um, there's been a concerted work to challenge this idea that academic English is a neutral or objective um, mode that is sort of equal ground for all of our students. So uh, April Baker Bell's work, Linguistic Justice, I think is an important example of that where she's looking at students in Detroit and uh, black students in Detroit and how the, just she's examining how the, expectations for these students to use white mainstream English is a problem. And it, it, it uh, you know, perpetuates the systemic racism of, um, of a language mode that is ultimately 
um, uh, aligned with white middle-class forms of English. Rosa and Flores do similar work. They trace out the history of academic English and, and its history is how it's tied to colonialism. And we continue to use it. We view it as the only way for producing legitimate meaning making in the university, which, you know, as I think about this sort of question of expressivist versus social language here, and I go back to like Bartholomew's view that, you know, um, you're thinking about how students are figured as simple minded or not yet ready for serious discussion, that they need to be sort of you know, redirected or cured or learn this thing in order to fully participate in our classrooms. He's talking here about the need to, to, to reproduce knowledge and meaning through uh, a specific form of, 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 of standard English or academic English. And, and so as I think about what resilience might mean and expressivism might mean, people like um, Rashawn Young, should writers use their own English? Uh, this is an academic article that you know, makes similar moves you know, as other creative writing pieces like Gloria Ndua or uh, Lisa Kinney, where there's this movement in between across discourses. And, and to some extent, I mean, this is my own experience. This ties too to something I talked about at the Humanity Center a couple of years ago when I talked about my approach in teaching writing and trying to build on my own background and the kinds of language that my I grew up using were different than academic English. Um, it's like a working class English or something. It's very different. I spent you know 15 years cooking before I came to graduate school and had a long history there where you know, you just talk different, it's just different. And um, it's not as formal or, you know, I don't know. But I guess the point I wanna make here is that as I think about expressivism and resilience, one way that this, this sort of, these conversations move forward for me are thinking about, you know, what are the effects or what does it mean to teach, teach academic discourse now? And, and how do we create space for that self-expressivism in our courses uh, for students, especially for students who, who don't come primed for academic discourse and, and think or create meaning in other ways using other kinds of language. So, so that's, that's something that I'm interested in further exploring, but I'm gonna end, I guess, just by talking about a few pragmatic ways that a lot of us can use in our courses to continue to build on expressive writing. And so one is, so some of these are widely used in composition today. Um, and some of them are, are, I think, gaining in prominence. So one, process reflection. So using, you know, letting students write without supervision or write without being assessed or evaluated. You know, let it, uh, it's an open-ended kind of students can use whatever mode they want to, but reflect on their work as they go. If they're working on high stakes um, writing projects, they can reflect as they move through the stages of the, of the writing process from drafting to revising to editing, to, to think about what they're doing, what the challenges are, how they're responding to those challenges. Other ways to use expressive writing, free writing and journaling. These are, you know, free writing is something I think that we've already talked a bit earlier, but uh, this is a way that students can invent ideas, discover, develop ideas without critique, without thinking about the reader. And, and that's an important element here, letting students tap into what they know and what they know better than you, uh, which, which is I think sometimes difficult to, to acknowledge. Um, using more open-ended questions that for like essay prompts that allow students more space to think about what's important to them. Um, uh, emphasizing labor over discourse forms. I think this is an important one and this is tied to other research that critiques um, that is trying to create a non-racist language practices in the university NUA is, uh, writes a lot about non-racist, uh, anti-racist approaches to assessment. So when you emphasize labor over discourse forms, you're asking students to show that they're doing work without you know, judging them for the language choices that they make, um, reinforce, without reinforcing um, you know, standard English models, uh, but letting them explore ideas and the modes that are the most important or 
useful or natural to them. Um, and in the pandemic online classroom, I think one thing that we need to think about whether or not we're ending the pandemic or not, it sounds today like we might be going more to a face-to-face -face world in the fall, but still, um, I think as we move to the online, there tends, I think this is true when anyone moves to online teaching that they feel the impetus to sort of assess everything students are writing or touch on everything students are writing, but the students need space, I think, to use writing in more informal ways to sort of play with ideas, develop ideas. And, and this aligns too for me with, with sort of what we know about expressive writing and being able to articulate what's important for them helps them move forward. And, and, and there needs to be space where they can do that without sort of feeling pressure, whether it's grades or critique or whatever. But um, anyway, Thank you very much and um, look forward to any conversation. Yes, thank you. So that concludes the presentation portion of this brown bag. Now we're moving to Q&A. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand physically or uh, use um, the reaction, raise your hand, or you can also put questions in the chat, so. All right. Ali? I thank you for that really wonderful talk. It gave me a lot of ideas. And um, some of this, my question might've been answered by you, Clay, at the very last slide, but I wondered, um, Carolyn, you were talking about Pennebaker's assignment. And I wondered how you address students' issues that come up. Um, do you respond back in writing? do you discuss uh, emotional issues in class? How do you work with that? Because I have the same thing happen in my classrooms uh, in art therapy. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question, Holly. Thank you. Um, I haven't given Penna Baker's assignment in class, but I can talk about, you know, kind of those moments when those things do come up because when I'm teaching a workshop, you know, often, um, and I've, I've done some things to try to like mitigate this, but someone will bring in something that's kind of un, uh, unprocessed and deals with trauma. And uh, in general, um, you know, what I would say, or what I have said, and, and, and others may have done, dealt with this maybe better than I have, but is to say basically can, you know, we focus on on audience and effect and how does, you know, what is the intention of the author with regard to their audience? Uh, because in creative writing, we're writing for readers. I mean, not, not only for readers, but eventually, you know, the, the idea of the reader is there and to try to be more intentional about what it is that we want that reader to feel, what the trajectory of emotion is for the reader. Um, and I really liked, you know, what I shared briefly from Roxane Gay's uh, kind of essay on teaching creative writing about trauma, which was how do you make space for the reader to see themselves? So there's, you know, kind of a, a way, you know, that you kind of work with the information so that it's not, you know, it's not only kind of expressivist writing, it's, it's going to be something that is um, molded or crafted. So, uh, and I have had experiences where, you know, there's a, kind of an emotional response. And I'm kind of thinking about um, my own kind of kind of clumsy when I was an undergraduate uh, person in creative writing, and not, you know, not having filters or whatever, and just basically saying, um, saying that this is just part of the way of this is part of how you learn how to write, <laughs> is that you find a balance uh, through trial and error and try to create spaces in the classroom where there is grace. And um, headroom for people to, to experience, you know, and find that balance for themselves. And so that's how I would, how I'd respond to that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, uh, John Michael Gruda says, where is the borderline between therapy and the educational process? While writing can be therapeutic, you don't necessarily want to do therapy, do you? Or is it a side effect? Um, yeah, I would say basically that the primary goal for me as a, as a teacher of writing is not to create a therapeutic intervention. However, 
I definitely want to be informed by the fact that there is this very mature evidence-based body of research in a neighboring field of psychology where the therapeutic effect of writing is demonstrated. So that's the balance I'm trying to find is like, what can I bring from what I'm reading about and learning about in psychology into the creative writing classroom to, I mean, perhaps amplify its value, not necessarily redirect it toward a therapeutic um, goal, but just to, to say, okay, I know about this and what does that do for a creative writing teacher? That makes sense. Uh, Dick, you'll need to unmute Dick, thanks. Dick, I think you're muted. Okay. There you go. How is it now? Yeah. You're good. We can okay. Um, Clay, uh, what about the larger question of larger questions of communication and community. Or uh, I love the way uh, Victor Turner, the anthropologist, uh, his term for community uh, is communitas, the Latin, uh, which means uh, connecting with other people on, on the basic level of their humanness. Um, and I think what happened, the Latin I think is instructive there because uh, it, it, uh, it really doesn't pertain to any specific community, but uh, the community of human being, communitas. Um, so I'm wondering if we look at uh, dialectal variations and let's say uh, um, a student speaks a, a variant dialect of English. Um, do you, have you done any work yet on how many variations there are uh, in, in say, uh, oh, um, standard English versus say, um, a black English. Uh, and if so, uh, do these present major obstacles or major problems beyond, uh, correctness and incorrectness, but, uh, basic, uh, problems that interfere with the construction of meaning. Yeah, I would say, uh, no, I haven't personally, but the, the research that I'm familiar with would answer that in a couple ways. One, uh, standard, like academic English isn't, you know, it's a kind of strange thing as I think of it. Um, it doesn't really live uh, in the way other languages, dialects do. Uh, people don't grow up learning you know, sort of standard academic English, but um, the, the challenge here is when, and this is something that Flores and Rosa talk about, is the problem, the challenge with appropriateness is that um, in a way, you know, the forms of standard English, academic, academic English don't really matter because for people who are racialized, they, um, they're not given the same kind of credit uh, and acknowledgement that people who are not racialized, people who are white, are, are given. They're, they don't, they're not given the leeway for reproducing the forms. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the challenge is, and this is something that writers of color talk about is, you know, even when they do reproduce standard English, they're not, they're not acknowledged in the same way that, that white language users are. And we can think, does it take public figures? You know, um, it, it's, you know, it's kind of embedded in Jonathan Rose's book title, uh, looking like a language, uh, sounding like a race. And some of these connections are inescapable uh, for students in the classroom. And so I think when, you know, the, I think that's the challenge that we face is creating a real community um, is would entail a, a, acknowledging that people can construct meaning without using standard English. And that meaning can be valuable, um, you know, verifiable, uh, rigorous, specific, you know, these kinds of things, but we don't give that space. Many, many 
of our colleagues do not give that space for students and they and they require this re, this reiteration of of academic english and you know for those who can who can sort of sort it out and 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 figure out how to play that game uh, they can experience success but many people don't and 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 i would suggest that that's likely you know part of the problem of diversity in um, academic institutions of higher education. Renata. I, I see two things. Of course, one should help students and allow them to express themselves as they want and need. On the other hand, if you're writing, you also want to be understood. And there's a certain amount of maybe politeness towards your lead, your readers or your listeners that will make you uh, express yourself in such a way that they can follow you. And, you know, everybody talks about Black English when they talk about, but if somebody starts writing into, in Scottish dialect they, in, in your class, they might have trouble getting understood and they're pretty white or Irish. I mean, there are a whole bunch of, of English dialects, including you could also uh, mention Southern American, which is spoken both by blacks and whites. And so, you know, there is a certain amount of accommodation, I think that also is necessary if you're talking to an audience. And what are you preparing your students for? Are you preparing them to just express themselves? Fine. Are you preparing them to be academics? Then they have to learn a way in which they will be recognized as academics. And if they do it really well, then they can play with academic English and, and make it uh, closer to some other thing, some other form of English. But it isn't automatic. And it doesn't necessarily have, I mean, I, I've taught some freshman composition and it doesn't necessarily turn up in the first or second papers that they write. They need to say, look, you know, this is the way you cross the street, uh, not against the red light because then you may be run over or something like that. So what, what do you see as a necessary, um, learning that will allow a student to be perceived and understood to the point where then they can change the way in which the original way in which they would have expressed themselves is perceived and understood. Anyway, I don't know whether I have expressed myself yeah. properly <laughs> academically. <laughs> I, it's a, I agree with, I mean, I, you know, I understand what you're, what you're saying. And, and I think as I sort of think to sort of filter back through some of the concepts of the talk of expressivism. And one thing I think about is, you know, there, I agree with readers and audiences are important and, but students need to make decisions on what kind of, how they're presenting themselves in those moments what kind of, what version of themselves do they want to present? And that requires some space. And, and I don't think that you need to use academic English to sort of develop content knowledge uh, about things. Um, and, and that's a way that, you know, faculty might rethink how writing is used in classrooms across disciplines. Uh, but another thing that is we could ask students to maybe write less to us as their instructors who are as a profession academics, but maybe to think about how they might write about things that are important to them to other audiences who are not primarily white uh, and and how they might present themselves in that way. Um, and so those are some ways that some of these things can still happen. There can still be sort of this idea of community, but I think the role, I mean, I think when we think though about sort of, for me, one thing resilience is a concept here seems like an issue to think more about and um, like how this might, what this might mean for some of our students in terms of the effect of language. But 
And I think we can look to more at how expressive writing in non-creative writing context can, can help maybe students create the space to think about all of these issues. Because I think to be effective adults uh, in, a, in a dynamic society, which we do have once you leave the, the academy, then I think you, you need to be able to negotiate these kinds of issues. Well, it's just that negotiation that I was trying to stress um, without, without necessarily condemning or accepting or whatever, yeah. any particular way. But who's, whom do you want to talk to? Yeah, I think also stressing, I mean, we can work on our pedagogy to really kind of emphasize that the resilience part of it, which is being flexible, adaptable, aware of what you're trying to do in the situation and context that you're yeah. trying to do it. Chris, did you have something you wanted to ask? Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Clay if uh, you can uh, talk about more about synthesizing your two approaches between expressivist and discursal and social and uh, establishing the ability to critique uh, a student's positionality. I think that that's a fantastic high, <laughs> high bar. But uh, is there a timetable for you that is involved in synthesizing these two approaches? Or, I mean, do you, how, how do you go about it? I mean, I find it absolutely fascinating and necessary, but uh, I'd like to hear more. Well, I would say it's been a challenge over the last year online um, to do this, but um, in my face-to-face -face teaching, I try to move myself away from using just academic discourse in, in sort of you know, verbal interactions as a way of creating space for people to communicate um, in alternative ways. Um, I don't know that I have an answer yet for um, how to deal with the power of um, academic discourse in the university. And I think that's something I'm still working to figure out. And I think it's a question that you know needs further work but I, um, a lot of the things I listed, I think I tried to do and use free writing to allow students to sort of figure out what they wanna do. And, and, and I think as I move forward though, how I s assign essays will change. I, 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 um, I don't think I'm creating enough space for students to pursue what they're interested in um, on their own terms. And I think maybe too much of it's predetermined by me and, Sometimes that's, you know, it's a balancing act though, because sometimes for like when I'm teaching English 1010, basic writing, where I want students to summarize, if I haven't read the text, it's hard to, you know, sort of help students summarize, but, you know, there needs to be a letting go on some things and, and letting students sort of work with language and writing and letting them fail. And, um, but I think the most important, I don't know if this is really helpful at all, Chris, but uh, anyways, work has probably been the most important for me. And I've used that a lot in the last year where I, I don't really grade for language forms. I, students get full credit if they meet labor requirements. So if they do certain kinds of moves along the way. And in one sense, like you would expect would this sort of lead to more A's, but really what's interesting, like students could literally do the bare minimum, which might be a word count mm -hmm. and and, and making certain kinds of revisions. Um, and, and you might think that they would sort of take the easy way out, but they still are working hard to produce good text. And it just is taking off the pressure that it has to be in a certain form. And so I'm trying to figure out how to let students define some of those outcomes um, and not just me imposing them. Can I, I uh, Clay, just a follow-up question. Um, uh, from my perspective, I, you know, I see that there may be grammatically six or eight variants. Uh, uh, how you form the past tense with regular verbs, for example, is, is one egregious example of that. Um, and um, I don't see that as uh, an onerous task to say, um, if you want to communicate with a wide audience, 
then you need to learn standard English. And there are, you know, there are seven or eight variants. Uh, you know, I can't remember exactly how many there are, but there are few in number. And you, you pick them up on a revision process. Um, so you write your first draft in whatever dialect you speak, but then you go back and you refine it. Everybody has to do revisions. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Joyce Carol Oates was one of the few writers who did very little uh, revision. And her um, uh, Canadian uh, friend, Alistair MacLeod, did very little revision and did it on, you know, the first, the first draft. But for most people, revision is a necessary process. I think that's an important conversation to have with students. Everybody, re well, almost everybody revises. Um, so how, if, you know, you, you want to enter, you want to connect with this group of people. And uh, these are people who may not be linguistically sophisticated, uh, but they're a group of doctors that you're you as a physician are presenting a report to, and so you want to uh, communicate your ideas uh, to them. So here's the common discourse that is used in this community. And I, I don't see that as an onerous task. I see that as an empowering task. And we're, we're immersed in a culture in, all, in, in which many, many cultural forms uh, are variant forms, our music, for example, uh, music that everybody listens to. Uh, the lyrics are inscribed in often non-standard English forms, but it doesn't stop people from dancing to that music. So I, I, uh, I would, you know, look for me, it's not, it's not a big question. Uh, I don't think that's a, a, a big expectation to have on, uh, to put on people. Um, revise, read over what you've said and handle those little things that are, you know, they're conventional, but they leave an impression on different communities. And you're gonna be talking to communities of people who are not English teachers, who are not academics. In when you, by and large, when you move out of uh, the academy and into the workplace. So Dick, yeah, I Sorry. Dick, Go ahead. No, I'm done. I, I, I want to agree with you, and but I usually, as the director of the center, I don't try to get involved in the conversation, so to let other, other people talk. But uh, there, there are ideas that have been canvassed here in this talk that uh, compel me to, to, to speak. I, I want to remind people that there is a vast, vast literature on what, what is called um, applied linguistics, contrastive language teaching that I, I see not mentioned at all in here. I mean, I, I really feel that any, any person practicing pedagogy in a community like Wayne State University, where there are there are thousands of students who come to come to our classrooms who speak what is called in the literature African American vernacular English. The term Black English has gone out of, of fashion a long time ago. There are clear linguistic patterns that are inherent in the speech of. African Americans and um, and um, other other minority groups that are captured in the literature. I believe that every composition teacher in this um, in this area, uh, teaching in the Detroit metropolitan um, area, should know about African American English. There are books written by John Rickford, by, by Lisa Green, by uh, Delpit. There are thousands of these books that uh, they should know so that they can understand um, when, when African-American kids come to school and bring the rich, the rich language that they, that they learned in, in, in the streets. And they're not, 
and they are able to to do to to do very well in terms of learning academic English. Uh, John Rickford's uh, program in California has shown the remarkable progress that African American kids can can make in in learning academic writing and uh, and so on. Uh, if teachers are able not just to talk generally about uh, being positively oriented to the vernaculars of various uh, uh, their students, but they themselves know. They, they, they have picked up a book on African-American vernacular English or monitor, I teach a course called African-American English, it's history and its structure um, that people can audit if they wish and they can understand these linguistic properties. I mean, people talk a lot, well, yeah, you should be more sympathetic towards um, the vernaculars and so on, but they themselves don't invest the time uh, to understand it and, and, and really believe in it. I mean, uh, we have a course here, at African American Vernacular English, that is not allowed to be a mandatory course in our linguistics program. You would think that, that, you, that you should make that course as part of your linguistics program a mandatory course so that people can respect it and understand it and so on. I'm sorry, Carolyn, but uh, I had to get in there. And, um, I can follow up can with this if I may. There, there's more I can say that, um, that I'm very passionate about in these, in these matters. May I follow up in that my last semester, two years ago, teaching and my courses were across listed with the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies so I could speak to cultural change. So I encourage, I think that also can be that classes can be cross listed with the Humanities Center. So when I came 37 years ago, there was predominantly a white dominant university in a, in a black identified city. And when I left, it remained the same. And my students told me that my classroom was one of the last bastions of a humanitarian overview and an active listening. And I was acknowledged as one of the professors who, who addressed and introduced students to, to black contemporary artists, which augmented the Euro, Eurocentric curriculum. 37 years later, even though there were courses in, that were supposed to address black culture, African history and the arts, but still, dominantly, we have not addressed exactly what Walter is speaking to. And in terms of Richard's point, when he's talking about the um, the kind of um, you know revisioning, I think I think um, when you talked about music, music in different forms, but you still compels us to dance, rap. I mean, most of the unique, okay, overall nationally, all of the uniquely um, American identified music forms have been founded by black culture, all of them, including rap, so, you know, jazz, blues, et cetera. And so rap has informed our language. And, and, and that um, it's very interesting because our French, our French, one of, um, someone proposed all the French names that we have destroyed in our English interpretation that's in Detroit. So my thought was to have all the sense of the the, 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 the um, my um, friends from Nigeria who would speak it in a proper English, friends from uh, students from um, the Detroit schools who would announce who are black who would pronounce those names in a different linguistic African American way, than than what a Frenchman would announce those names. And so that kind of diversity is not acknowledged. And I just wanted to second what Walter was saying because I was feeling the same. I I left the university heartbroken. Thank, thank, thank you, Marilyn. I, I realized that I, I really um, made the talk go much longer than people want to, and I should have allowed it to, to, to end naturally. But I, Well, this is the second I, time you've stopped me, I <laughs> but that, I won't take it personally. That, that, that <laughs> I think um, Kennedy has a small uh, little speech that she gives at the end of talks. Kennedy, are you still here? Yes, I'm still here, Dr. Edwards. Um, to 
both of our wonderful speakers. Just want to thank you on behalf of the Humanity Center. Um, we're so grateful to give you two and your working group the platform to share this research. Um, and as a small token of our gratitude, the Humanity Center has two gifts for both of you, a mask and a journal with our logo on it that will be reaching out to you towards the end of the semester to safely get these gifts to you um, because of COVID. But again, thank you so much. And this has been recorded and it will most likely go up uh, no later than this Friday. If anyone wants to go back to our website and check out or um, expand on the discussion. So thank you again. And if our speakers have anything to say before we go. 